turn to John chapter 20. Not going to sell out our corner here because people like our hot dogs and some of, them, some of those people, they don't have enough money to pay for the hot dogs and so I'm just going to give them away for free. I mean, y'all, y'all, listen, I, y'all can sell what you want. I'm not, okay, sell all you want. And so they realize they can't buy me out. So they try to hire thugs against me, and they figure out quickly that that doesn't work either. And uh, so then they'll try to have the city council outlaw my business and, uh, and try to get it to where um, it'll be against the law for me to give away hot dogs. For some reason, they'll come up with any reason in the world, uh, but it'll be okay for them. And that's really how, that's really what's going on. If you read Galatians uh, chapter f- uh, 5, I believe it is, that's what you're going to see there. Paul, Paul said that just as then, same as now, that those who are receiving the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God, absolutely free, are going to be Uh, persecuted by those who sell grace and who sell forgiveness of sins. They're going to be persecuted by them. And so that persecution has come and it will come and it will continue to come. And that's what that, I was thinking about that when we were singing that song. Uh, It's dangerous to throw out the lifeline. I mean, what, what happens if, my goodness, if we get pulled overboard too, we're trying to save people, amen? And uh, what cost is there for a person's soul? That's just how I look at it. John chapter uh, 20, and uh, I appreciate you being here tonight. John, Ch- By the way, uh, Michaela's back in the hospital again. Um, called Lisa last night. Uh, about that time we were going to bed and said that Michaela was in a lot of pain during the night last night and uh, was not doing well at all. And uh, so Lisa packed a bag and, and thought she might have to get up in the middle of the night. And sure enough, she did and uh, came over here and they went up to Children's Hospital uh, sometime around 1, 2 o'clock, something like that, 3 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around in there. And um, this found out nobody likes uh, was basically just going to send Michaela home. And um, Alicia, listen, some things are worth fighting for. And she, she stood up and stood her ground and she said, listen, if you send me home, I guarantee you I'm coming back. And I'm going to keep coming back. Until you do something for my daughter. Some things are worth it. Amen. And so. <laughs> lo and behold. The doctor had a change of heart. And. Uh, so anyway. She's uh, in the hospital now. They, uh, may, they might try to do the MRI. That, that she had planned. And so just pray uh, for her. And pray for the family. And it's, you know, it's not going to be easy. In the next coming days. As we'll be leaving and so on. So just just please lift up our family, if you would, please. All right. John chapter uh, 20. Uh, we've already looked into, we already begun there with uh, verse 1, the first day of the week. Uh, that's because the first things always belong to God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, this is where uh, Mary Magdalene came to the sepulcher. And looked and didn't find Jesus, but found the uh, the bedclothes uh, folded and and put put aside, and then the other place, and how that could not that, that that image right there is not Jesus. I will not kneel before it. I will not bow to it. Ah, right there, everybody that sees that should believe in Jesus Christ. And boy, did I, when I first thought that, and I was about, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, something like that. uh, Now I'm looking at it and going, 
Oh, ooh and ah. Oh, boy, Jesus is alive. Boy, if people can read this, surely they'll believe. Well, they don't. You have all kinds of, you know, Easter Sunday is usually, and I don't care what church or denomination it is, most attended service of the entire year. And yet very few people are saved on that day. They, they hear stories about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but no one acts on it. No one does anything about it. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. We're not my soul in hell, neither would thou suffer thine holy one to see cold run. All right. So we'll start it. Uh, let's see here. I don't remember if I read this. So we'll start it here. Mary stood without. Yeah, we did. Look at that. Let's go. Let's go down to. Uh, right here. Right here is where I want to be. In fact, let's go to prayer first. Then we'll look at it. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. We thank you, Lord. Uh, for this day you've given us, Father, I do ask for your blessing and your help uh, for my family this week and in the, ne in the coming weeks. Uh, Lord, it should be with my wife and give her grace and give her uh, solace, dear God, and, and give, her, um, give her comfort, Lord, while her husband's gone. Lord, I know the burden that uh, she carries, uh, Father, but I also know, Lord, that you help her. And you use her during this time. And Lord, that blesses my soul. That does. That just, I just want to shout and give you praise, Lord. So, I, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would do again what you've done in the past. That you would bless all my family uh, in my absence. And not, not just my blood kin, but also my church family here. Uh, that you'd bless them in my absence and bless those who are coming to preach in my stead i pray lord that you would just bless them give them some wonderful words father and and just open up uh, the our ears to hear the word of god preached uh, from the men that you've called to this place i appreciate their help father i appreciate god their faithfulness not just to me but to your word and father that i don't have to worry about these guys and what they're going to preach and what nonsense they're going to come off with because I know their heart. I know what they believe. And I know, Father, that they believe this old book is right. And they're not going to say behind my pulpit that maybe the Bible's got a few mistakes in it. God, I thank you for that. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just open up your with my church uh, in my absence. Father, Lord, bless the people of Kenya. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use us in a mighty way. And, uh, Lord, just draw our hearts together in love. Uh, even though, Lord, we're separated by distance, Father, we can be joined together through your spirit and in love. Father, just bless the word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the God said, amen. And so in verse 19, uh, then the same day at evening, uh, being the first day of the week, uh, when the doors were shut, uh, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews and uh, I wanted to touch on that uh, a little bit and and just let you know that their fear uh, although it was legitimate fear because the Jews at this time were angry and you would think you would think that a normal person upon hearing about some man being resurrected from the dead and the evidence given that a man actually had died. And I think I preached this Sunday that what if that in that casket where, where Cubby's sister was laid, she's already been embalmed and, and already prepared. And, and lo and behold, in the presence of everybody, an angel appears, the angel of the Lord appears, and all of a sudden, she gets up and she looks at where she is and the angel helps her rise up. She rises up. The angel helps her get out of that casket. She gets out of that casket, looks at everybody and says, what is wrong with you people? Have you not ever seen me before? 
And I guarantee you there'd be shouting. There'd be happiness in that place. Amen. But that's not what's happening. The Jews are scared to death. Uh, and out of the, whether it's the Jews or Peter and the disciples, who's scared more? The Jews. They're scared more. Why? They're fixing to lose their whole religion. Their whole power base is fixing to be wiped away by this man who dared come back to life again after they'd already spent so much time and effort to have him killed. How dare he do this thing? And, but yet, we have the disciples afraid of what the Jews might do. And um, I did it, and I encourage you to do this. I may preach it again one of these days. But I did a study through the book of Acts one time. And I really wasn't looking for this, but it occurred to me that all through the book of Acts, they could have, they could have called the book of Acts the book of the, of the deadly acts of the Jews. The book of how the Jews wanted everybody else dead. All the believers in Christ dead, because that's what you find in the book of Acts. I mean, the Jews have assembled an army and they're going after everyone who claims the name of Jesus Christ. And they're either going to scare them out of their faith or they're going to have them killed because of their faith. But they're not going to sit and let this, this faith in Jesus Christ just take its course. And they were, they were, um, uh, they were encouraged to do so, weren't they? Who stood up among them in the book of Acts and said, fellas, why don't we just let these guys be? Remember who that was? Huh? No. Caiaphas hated them. I'm thinking it was, uh, I better not say because I'll be wrong. Somebody can look that up real quick. Who was it? We're talking Acts chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, somewhere around in there. I mean, who's, who stood up to, amongst the Jews and said, boys, you remember that guy that came up and said he was the Messiah and he had a bunch of people following him and, huh? It came to nothing. So what? If this guy's, if this guy's not the Messiah, it's going to go the same way. It'll come to nothing. These people will fall out because their leader's dead and then we won't have to worry about it anymore. But if this guy really is alive and he's sent from God, we're on the wrong side. We're on the wrong side. And does any one of us want to be accused of fighting against God? Ooh, no way. Okay. So now they are assembled for fear of the Jews. John chapter 20, verse 9. Gamaliel. Gamamiel. Yeah. Gamaliel. Say, say Gamaliel. Yeah. Say, say goat meal. Okay, that's who it is. All right, anyway. Um, For fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now remember, the disciples are hiding because they're afraid of G they're afraid of the Jews and they're afraid, you know, to go and boldly proclaim Jesus. So Jesus said, I've got a little trick I'm going to play on them. Hey, angels, watch this. And he ends up in, in the midst of them where they're sitting and hiding from it. And you can probably imagine some of them going, oh my Lord, why did he show up here? We're all going to get our necks hung. We're all going to be dead before morning. Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, peace be unto you. Remember, they're afraid. But I just have a feeling that when Jesus says peace, peace happens. Does it not? 
when they were on the ship and Jesus was down below asleep and they came down, Jesus, cares thou not that we perish? Jesus stands up and goes and says, peace be still. And all of a sudden, boom, everything's calm. Nap time again for Jesus. Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus unto them, peace be unto you. My father has sent. And saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now I've got this divided up in two sections. It's a matter with my, with my, uh, with my breath, with my mouth. You know, Michael, I was listening to that today, one of the recordings. And we may have to move the receiver, like down here where it picks me up better and send it by, by line up there. So I appreciate you saying that. Let me send it over here where the receiver can hear it better. But anyway, uh, peace be unto you. And he says, we're going to divide this up in two different teachings. Number one... The, why Jesus breathed on them and said, peace be unto you. And he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, let's deal with this first part when he said, uh, he breathed on them, peace be unto you. Um... And he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, uh, it is sown. A natural body is talking about this body. It's, it's, a, it's a seed. It's a seed. And we don't bury it. We plant it. We're going to plant the seed of our loved ones into the ground in hopes that God would raise them up at the last day and they would be in his image. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And don't let anybody tell you any different. Don't, and don't let these naysayers, especially when it comes to um, understanding Genesis 6, and the sons of God, the daughters of men. And when they say, well, those were spirits. How can spirits? And their, their understanding of spirits is that they can just kind of wave their hand and pass through things. And that there's no substance to them. But they are a body. They are a body. There is a natural body. And there is a spiritual body. It has a form. It has a shape. It has a substance to it. We do not know exactly what that substance is. We may not quite understand it. But and yet there it is right there before you. The Bible's telling you there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. What does he mean by that? He's, re he's referring to God in Genesis chapter 2. Creating Adam out of the dust of the earth and then breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a what? Living soul. It's exactly what uh, he says here in 1 Corinthians 15. But then he says the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Quickening means to, to be made alive. To reanimate it, in other words, to give it life. Like, like uh, uh, Eli, uh, um, uh, Ezekiel prophesying to the four corners, or the four breaths, the, what am I trying to say? Four winds. The four winds, and the four winds blew, and it blew into the nostrils of all of those, those dead bodies out there. And all, lo and behold, they stood up. Uh, a mighty army, the Bible says. And so now they have the breath of the quickening spirit inside of them. You think that army's going to lose anything? Shoot, no. 
They're not going to lose any battle. Their, their victory is automatically a, a shoe in, amen, or a breathe in. One way. So there it is in, in the Bible, Genesis 2, 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. If anybody asks you what the soul is, just say it is the breath of God that exists in every human being. Every human being, not just the saved human being. Because remember, everybody's got a soul. Everybody does. And some souls are made to be taken and destroyed. Some souls will be made alive and will be given a new body and will live in the new heaven and the new earth. And watch the old earth and the old heaven pass away and all of those things. Okay. But in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, I like this. This is God now blowing into us the breath of God by way of the Bible. All scripture is given by in Inspiration. Spira. That's where we get the word spirit. Inspired. Uh, that's, that's how the word of God came to this world. When people say, oh, the Bible is written by men. You say, you know what? You're right about that. However, there's something that you missed. Because I, I, I'm sure if you would have read this in the Bible, you would know it. Is that 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all the scripture was given by inspiration of God. That means that God breathed into those men's souls the very exact words that he wanted them to say. Now, here's what I like. Uh, you've heard me teach before about how you recognize, let's say, John's writing. When you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, it's, it's possible that they, they could have read from a single source of the Gospels and, you know, added a few words here and there as the Holy Spirit led them. But the bottom line is every word that Matthew wrote down came by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter, okay? Uh, they're called the synoptic, synoptic Gospels. They look alike. Synoptic, that's what it means. They look alike. They have the same stories. They sort of follow the same outline. They, they deal with the resurrection of Christ the same way, or the, the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Christ in a very similar fashion. And they follow basically the same outline. So that causes... Some scholars, especially some in the Vatican, to say that they all borrowed from a document called Q, which stands for quell. Uh, I'm not sure what that, what that implies, but anyway, they say that the Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't get their, their story any place except this one document, and they all copied from it, and then that document was... I don't know, burned away or something, destroyed or whatever. But then you have John. John obviously didn't get to see Quell, the Q document. He didn't get to see it. So he just writes his gospel, the life and the death and the life again of Jesus Christ. He writes it as he remembers it. And he writes it in the way that John would write something. Because John had his own mannerisms. And you can say, well, see, those mannerisms prove that it was men that wrote the Bible. They chose the words that they used and they wrote in a certain way. So that just says that men wrote the Bible. No. God made those men. In fact, here's, here's what I know and here's what I believe about every writer of the Bible. 
is that if you take every writer of the Bible and you glue them all together, they're all going to be the pieces of a man named Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? It's like a puzzle with 40 pieces. Okay? Not hard to put together. Okay? And with John, five of the pieces look almost exactly alike. <laughs> but with Paul, 14 of them look almost identical. Okay? So it's not hard to put this together. And you put together this 40-piece puzzle, and it looks like Jesus Christ. Because he's the Word of God. Okay, and that's how I see it. God doesn't matter that they that you'll see John saying bear record, bear record, bear record. You know, you know, bear uh, bear testimony, bear witness, bear witness. He says it in in the gospel. He says it in first, second, third John. He says it in Revelation. Doesn't matter. It's still that that is a part of who Jesus is. And John is just simply writing down what the Holy Ghost is telling him to write down using his own character and his own nature because that came from Jesus himself. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, all right. I have a really weird illustration, but it, it doesn't really... Well, I'll go ahead and tell you. There was a comic book writer by the name of Jack Kirby. Has anybody ever heard of him? Okay. He, he wrote comics for Marvel for a while, and then DC. So, whether he's writing and drawing comics for Marvel, or he's writing and drawing comics for DC Comics, can you still tell that it's Jack Kirby? If you know Jack Kirby, you can tell that's Jack, that's Jack Kirby right there. Okay. When you read like the same author after three or four books... Somebody can hand you a book and you read it and go, oh, that, that must have been written by so-and-so because it just looks like they're writing. I'll get off of that. But anyway, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed it into them. Just like, so when God breathed into, uh, here's what I want to get to. When God, when Jesus breathed into these men and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. What was he actually doing by doing that? By blowing that breath into them? What was he actually doing with them? Giving them understanding. Giving them life. Huh? That's part of it. He's the Messiah. That's part of it. Nope. Well, I mean, that's part of it too. Here's what I'm getting at. And now all of them have their share of the New Testament. See it now? Because these are the men that are going to get everything started in Acts chapter 2. And so Jesus has to blow this in him in them now to prepare them because... Like in Acts chapter 1, they need a little understanding of what's going to happen after Jesus disappears. Because once Jesus disappears, they've got a little time here between Jesus leaving and on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus has told them to wait. And so the church isn't guideless. The church isn't just wandering the ship is still being steered correctly by the men whom Jesus breathed into and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. So that on the day of Pentecost, these same men now, what are they doing? Preaching a sermon without a Bible. Do they need one? No, they just had it blowed into them. That's, that's what I think, all right? Let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, now, this one. I like this one. Yeah, the, there were the seven lamps of fire. This is the Old and the New Testament. Je when Jesus breathed into them, what was he breathing into them? The seven spirits of God. Because the seven spirits of God 
are exactly like the candlestick. Your lungs with the seven pipes. One, oh, I didn't know that was touch thing. Come on, get back up there. I don't know how to do it. Get back up there. There we go. Your lungs, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven candlesticks. This is the bronchial tube. When you have bronchitis, this is where it is. It's in the bronchial tubes. And the bronchial tubes are exactly like the pipes of the candlestick. It has seven pipes to it. And at the end, I don't have this in the notes here, but at the end of those seven pipes, they have these little, uh, uh, what are they called? Alveoli? Huh? Yeah, these little things that transfer oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the lungs. And they look like fruit hanging from a tree. And here's what, I, here's what I love about this. On one side, you have a tree. On the other side, you have a tree. Because the one on this side, no. The one on this side is your lungs. And when you blow out what's in your lungs, it's carbon dioxide, and the trees need carbon dioxide. The trees, however, they take in carbon dioxide and they breathe in, and when they breathe out, they breathe out what? Oxygen, which is what we need. Amen. It's just like a oh, look look at oh look at look at Psalm one. Hurry while I'm still happy about it. Look at Psalm one. Woo. I remember giving an example of Psalm one uh, while I was out in, in uh, Rongo, Kenya, and. You see out there, they don't have seasons like we do. So the trees don't change colors and all that. So I'd teach them a little bit about it. And when I did, and I read Psalm 1, uh, verse 3, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. A couple of the men, they just went, Whoa, amen, and tears in their eyes. Because like, it wasn't just... Uh, some metaphor that like a thought experiment in our brain it was real God had made it real to these men and I just love that because what I want to do Chris what I want to do out there the same thing I do here I want all of those people out there to know that this Bible isn't just a storybook of Aesop's fables and myths. We have not brought unto you cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you. It's not just a book of make-believe. It's real. And when I say he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of living water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I want those people to know that it's exactly that way. It's not just make-believe. And I struggle with, this is, this is one of my favorite psalms. In fact, it is my favorite psalm. But God knows how many times I read it and I prayed. I said, God, that's not happening with me. I'm not, I don't see myself prospering. Too awfully well. And God said, Ain't season, stupid. Wait till season. Then it'll then it'll prosper. Then it'll seed. Amen. And he was right.
He was right, right, right. I've told you about the, the little decorations there on each branch, on each pipe. You've got a flower. You've got a, a bud or a knob or a knob. And you have a bowl. And that basically, that basically is you're looking at an almond tree. And it's out of, out of all of these that the oil comes from that gives light into the sanctuary. There is, if it wasn't for this, the sanctuary would be completely dark. So think about all the verses in the Bible where it talks about thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's not just make-believe. It's not just some metaphor. It is exactly, it means exactly those words there. So three plus three plus three. So that's nine on this one here. Nine on the one, on the one there. Nine on the one there. So, so we got 27 there and 27 over here. But we've got... Uh, three, six, nine, twelve here. So together we have sixty-six divided up exactly the way your Bible is divided up. Exactly the way your Bible is divided up. So Jesus said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And when he did that, he was imparting to those men. Um, let me show it. Let me show it to you like this. Turn to Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Here's what um, Jesus was doing. Amen, amen, amen. Jeremiah 31. 31. 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. This, this shuts down every Seventh-day Adventist church, every Hebrew roots, every one of them, every, all the law keepers, everything. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. See, God didn't break the covenant. They did. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. He said, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put in my, I will put my law in their inward parts. How? And will be and write it in their hearts. That, that Paul said that. Uh, where did he say that? He said, "You are our epistle, written and known of men, not not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart." Okay. Um, uh, back in uh, Jeremiah, he said. Um, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least unto, uh, of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember uh, their sin no more. And what what is Israel? You, if you read this here... If, what does Israel have to do in order to get this? Doesn't say a flipping thing that they got to do to receive that. They're just going to get it. Amen? Same way you got it. What did you do to deserve the grace that was given unto you? You didn't do nothing. But God just did it unto you. Now, we got a little time here. Um... If I go back to this verse, and uh, those of you, uh, listen to me, those of you who, who have Catholic uh, background, you have Catholic 
family members, you have Catholic friends, uh, Catholic um, family members, and so on. If you uh, have them, um, I want you to pay close attention to this. In John chapter 20, verse, let's see here, verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retained, they are retained. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is the Catholic Church uses this verse to prove, prove now. Let me put my mark here in, in John 20, verse 23. To prove to everybody that only the Catholic priesthood can have the power to forgive sins here on this earth. They have the power. They set up little, uh, little, little jail cells that you go into. Some of them, well, I would say most of them, they can see who's in there. And so every, every Catholic priest knows in his uh, pipeline of people who has money. He knows in his pipeline who the loose women are. He knows in his pipeline who the dirty little boys are. Where does he get that information? He gets it from the confessional. So the Catholic Church gives these priests this, this power over those people. And I guarantee you, if they know you got money, the church is getting it out of you. Guarantee. Especially if you're a dyed-in-the-wool Catholic. If you, if you, listen, if you live in some village in Italy, you ain't no Baptist, I can tell you that. If you're, not anything, if, if you're not anything else, you're a Roman Catholic. And they know you got money, and they're going to get it. One way or the other, they're going to get it. And they know who all the, the boys are that, that they can go after. They know who all the girls are they can go after. They know all the women they can go after. And they've got them in a little pipeline. Uh, let me, I'll tell you very quickly, uh, there used to be a family in this church. Uh, when they started coming here, they, they felt like they needed to tell me a little bit about some of their family relations. And they said that, um, that there was a, uh, a brother to one of the two. There was a brother that had married a woman and she was a Roman Catholic. And uh, this brother really wasn't much of anything, but his wife was uh, supposedly very faithful to the Catholic Church. What this man found out eventually was that this woman was carrying on with the Catholic priest in that area. And uh, he wanted to get rid of her, wanted to divorce her. Well, let me tell you why he didn't. That priest, along with carrying on with this man's wife, was a money launderer for his brother who was linked in with the Italian mafia up on Dago Hill up in St. Louis. In other words, this man, this priest, was a bag man for the mafia. They laundered money. Through him and probably through a network of other priests, they laundered their money through the Catholic Church. Catholic Church gets a big chunk of it. That priest gets a chunk of it. And then whoever's running the mafia scam or whatever, they're getting it back clean because it came from where? It came from the Catholic Church. And what does the IRS have to do with the Catholic Church? Not a thing. They don't dare go after them. They don't dare. OK, 
Okay? And uh, so here's this man. He's just stuck in a marriage. And he's not, all, he's not the best guy in the world. So he don't really care. His wife is going on with this priest. So that just lets him do whatever he wants to. And um, I mean, this, this information came to me second hand, not first hand, but second hand. Uh, but I, I believe it. I believe it because the same thing goes on in Kenya. Okay. And so anyway, that's the kind of uh, power that that church has with people. And that confessional is nothing but a pipeline of iniquity. So, now, here's what, here's what these verses are really for, okay? Let's go down here and let's look at Matthew 18, because that is a part of the Gospels that gives you the real explanation of how it is that Christ gives people in the church the ability to forgive sins. So Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. <clears throat> Jesus, and this, this, this is spelled out very, very clear. Um, in fact, let me make this bigger so some people can see it better. There. There. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, so let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, uh, oh, I don't know, I had to, had to get on to JR about something, okay? And, uh, I mean, I like Jr. I love him, and I and you know I I understand everybody makes mistakes, so I'm not I'm not going after him. Try to get him out of the church. I'm going to go to him. I said, Jr. Let me sit down and talk with you a minute. Okay, don't don't be afraid. Okay, I love you, and and let me let me explain this to everybody in this church in case. I found out years ago, and I'm glad I found it out when I did, that. Um, I am by law forbidden of telling anybody, including my own wife, anything told to me as the minister, the pastor, the reverend of this church, anything told to me in confidence in this, in this church or anybody who comes to me says, Pastor, I need to tell somebody something. You're a minister, and I know that you cannot... I, by law, I cannot divulge what that person admitted to me, even if I was subpoenaed in court, and the lawyers wanted to try to get me to admit or um, maybe confer a second witness from what somebody else has said, I'm forbidden by law to tell anything that anybody has confessed to me. And that, of course, that comes from the Catholic Church, but it extends to all recognized religions in the United States of America, that if he confesses something to me that was illegal, that I have to keep that and I'm not allowed to say it unless he gives me permission. The exception to that rule is uh, a crime against a child. In that case, not only am I uh, not to be uh, silent about it, I am obligated, and I have done that several times. I didn't like it, but I've done that. I've had to pick up the phone several times and call it in. And uh, so anyway, that's just, that's the law. That's how it works. So if you tell me something, and doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not a crime against a child, anything you tell me is in absolute strict confidence. And I cannot divulge it to anybody, including my wife, all right? 
So, he says, um, if he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. In other words, from that point forward, that sin is confessed, forgiven, and done. I don't care what kind of gossip goes on in the church, which ought not be done. That sin is remitted. It is forgiven and it's over with. But then he says, verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. That at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, I just got done doing a watchman on that. That's the requirement. Two or three. Can I add four or five or six to it? Nope. No, John. It's either two. It's either somebody with me. Who also knows. I can't just take somebody and say, hey, you're fixing to hear something. I can't do that. They have to know it. Uh, or take three people who know it and go to them. And all of it is done to restore J.R. If we dare go in after him and say, listen, boy, we'll kick you right out of this place. We got the wrong attitude. God will get us. So then verse 17, but if he, now, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Now it has to become an open issue. And, I, and I'm going to tell him that. Um, I guess I can say it because it's, I mean, it's already happened, but y'all know a situation where I had to do this here. And I said to those involved, look, I hate to say this, but if we can't get this taken care of right now, my next obligation is to take it before the church. And I don't want to do that. And I want to tell you something. The anger on that man's face. He exploded. And it was over with right then. I mean I tried. But it was over with right then. What kind of church is this? What kind of preacher are you? You do that. And, and I mean I got all kinds of threats. And ca called all kinds of names. And cursed at and everything else. But I held my ground. I hated it. I hated everything about it. But anyway, um, if he shall neglect to hear them, it, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Okay, so any time between the first witness, me and J.R., and bringing it to the church... And the church pleading and saying, please don't do this. Don't go this way. Anything between those two points there that can be forgiven, repented, remitted, and done. And God will honor that. God will honor that. That's, that's what he's saying here in, in John 20. Whatsoever, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And it's, and it's linked to this. So he, then he says, um, verse 18, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. There it is. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That, there it is right there. In other words, God's saying, church, Bethel church, if you have to get to the point where this has to come out to the church, and they still won't repent. You're to put them out as a heathen and a publican. And you're to cast them out. And their sins will be unto them as unforgiven. Whew. 
So he says in verse 19, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them, for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That is, it's not the power that a priest has, that I have over anybody in the church. It's the power that Jesus gives to every individual church. The, all of the steps, all the way up to the end, are in, they are there to try to restore the sinner. That's what they're there for. Don't get that part wrong. It's like the guy I told you, and uh, this was told me by Pete Rubel over at Lighthouse Baptist. He's no longer there anymore, but um, he told me, he said he had a man in his church that was constantly, he'd find out things about people in the church. Pastor, I think we need to have church discipline on them. Pastor, I think we need to bring them before the church. All right, what are you not understanding here? Why are you just wanting to take everybody and throw them out? I gotta quit. But that's, to me, that's, that sounds like sound doctrine to me. And wouldn't that be fair enough? I mean, you've been given one chance. Now you've got the two or three witnesses. That's a second chance. Now you've brought before the church. That's a third chance that you've got. You've got three chances now to finally let God break you and say, I did it. I'm sorry. And it's forgiven. And if it, listen, if I found out anybody else was making comments about it, I'd go to them with their sin, their sin of gossip. Because I wouldn't put up with that. We're supposed to love each other. Not stab each other in the back, in the face, or anywhere else for that matter. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen.